Sweet surrender. So the, we began our service imagining what heaven is like. And heaven is infinitely good. It's a very high vibration. I've always been excited or uh, energized by the idea of heaven on earth, that the entire intention for us to be on this planet is to we're evolving into heaven. And in fact, if you look at anthropologists or um, psychologists or sociologists, the very history that they're that our earth is evolving into greater and greater good, that there is actually developmental stages. If you've heard of spiral dynamics or integral theory, they're looking at the, the entire planet, how it's been evolving to greater and greater goodness. We're far more compassionate and loving today than back in the Middle Ages, where it was much more violent. Our expectations are higher, so we might be disappointed at times as we are now for how, you know, I was thinking even this call for our government to be um, this transparency, and I thought, well, when in history have we expected governments to be transparent? So there's a, a higher evolution stage that's always unfolding through us, and it's good. It is infinitely good. This month, we've also been talking about healing and, and a little bit how it's different than cure. So cure is on the physical world. So a cure would look like if I'm physically ill, and now I'm healthy. I don't have money, now I do. Relationships are bad, now they're good. So things change in our judgment, judgmental mind in this dualistic world from bad to good. And of course we always prefer the good, so it's nice when cure happens. But we're real, what we really want to strive for is that healing. Because this is a mysterious universe and we don't know why some people are cured and some people are not. We have our theories, we have our, our un, different ways of looking at things, but we actually don't really know. But everyone, healing is available to everyone. We are all made in the image and likeness of pure love, of pure joy, of pure bliss. This love, this joy, this bliss never leaves. It never can be added onto. It can never be taken away from. It's within us, and nothing can ever touch it. It can never be hurt, harmed, or endangered. It is always whole and perfect as us. And so the healing is the more we become identified with that, the more we open up to our always already infinite oceanic love, we become free in vast places of freedom and joy and beauty and harmony and creativity. All that we see as heaven, we become that. That's what heaven is. The sweet surrender is about I can trust that when I surrender to this infinite self within me, as I open myself to this presence, I'm opening myself to good. Over and over as I've talked with people, and only even in my own life, there are times where I'm a little afraid to totally surrender because I'm not quite sure if God's got it better than me. Like, I sometimes think I'm smarter. <clears throat> and I, you know, I want what I want, and I'm not sure if God's really on board with me about that. <laughs> so so we, we hold back sometimes, but when we start to really, so it's important to look, remind ourselves of the big picture and to say, to trust deeply and profoundly with our whole heart, body, mind, and soul that this presence is only evolving itself to greater and greater good, not only as a planet, but as our individual lives, that, we, that this presence, the infinite self, I am that I am, that's in our hearts, is only evolving us specifically and uniquely to greater and greater good. And it knows what is better for us than we know for ourselves. <clears throat> now, this is all wonderful, but then the question becomes, okay, I have this high ideal. I want to live my life for this infinite wellspring of good, this infinite love. I want to wake up to the truth of who and what I am. How do I actually live this day in and day out in the, all the stuff that we are surrounded with? Well, for me, I, I'm just going to share how that looked for me. And because uh, for, for many people, sometimes that surrender comes through pain. The pain pushes until the vision pulls. So it was back in 1991. <clears throat> By this time in my life, I'd already done some therapy. I understood my patterns. I had also learned uh, universal truth principles about how your mind works, the power of mind. I created a life that uh, I, I intended to create a certain life, and I got it. So I knew all those things, and yet I got into a place in a relationship with a, with a, a boy, boy. Yes, we were boys and girls back then. <laughs> and I couldn't get out of it. Like, it. There was good to it, but I also knew it was wrong for me. That this was, I was, it was going down a trajectory that was not healthy for me. So I kept making the intention, I'm going to break up with him. And every time I did that, literally within 24 hours, I would get 
completely sick. My, so though my mind knew one thing, my entire physical, emotional body would just shut down. And I would get, my throat would swell up, I'd get all white and pussy, I'd get 105 fever. Three times this happened. And it was, that's how, and I couldn't understand it. You know, I knew I could go back with my therapy and talk about my family, I could know the power of mind, but none of it was touching this deep sense of, of emotional need I had from this particular relationship and that I couldn't, I was, felt powerless in getting myself out of it. And that powerlessness kept was sending me on a spiral lower and lower. That, wow, I really have no power in the universe. I know all this stuff, and I still can't move forward in my life in a good way. And so that powerlessness dropped, dropped me deeper and deeper into this place of, of hopelessness. <clears throat> and it was in that place, I was visiting my brother and his family in Boston, where I used to live. So I was wandering around, and I went into the Old South Church in Copley Square, it was during the weekday, and I just sat in the back, and I just realized the only thing that mattered to me was living my life for God. That all the hopelessness, I couldn't control anything else, but I loved God, and I knew that. I'd always had, but now I couldn't just love God a little bit. I had to give my whole life to this presence. <laughs> and so I just said, how do I do that? There, it's nice to have that. You know, uh, Howard Thurman, the theologian, said, keep fresh before me my moments of high resolve. So I had that moment of my life is here for God. God is first in my life. But how do I keep that fresh? How do I keep that alive? So I spent the next week just sort of walking around and listening. How do I do this? How do I live this? And it, and it came to me. These three practices came to me. And it, <clears throat> and it wasn't just about the three practices. What it became about is those three practices, when I did them, that was saying to my heart, to that infinite presence within me, that God is more important to me than anything else. So I had to commit to those three practices, regardless of how busy I was, regardless of what my relationships were looking like, regardless of how my job, my school, it had to, those, they had to be more important than my emotional life. So even if I was an unemotional, I do those practices. And if I'm an emotional tailspin, I do my practices. No matter how tired I am, I'm going to do those practices. And what that was constantly telling myself to that infinite I am that is closer to us, than our very breath, is that God is bigger than all of this stuff. All of this stuff that I keep getting trapped in, all these emotions, God's bigger than all that. So I made the commitment, and I also made the commitment, I'm going to stop trying to fix my life. So I stopped trying to break up the relationship. I stopped trying to make my life better. My only focus was I've got to do these three things every day. And so that's what I started to do. A few months later, I had people in my class like you, I like to always be learning something. And they were commenting on how different I was, how changed I was. And I remember being surprised because I had made the commitment that I wasn't going to try to change myself anymore. And so I'm like, oh, I've changed. <laughs> and I realized that I didn't have to do it. That in surrendering to the spirit through these practices, by focusing on spirit, what I was doing was creating a space for that presence to work through its goodness through my life finally. That now I was letting go of control and the spiritual practices were just a, 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 a tool to open up and allow that always already good that is always wanting to give of itself to us specifically and uniquely, that is wanting to pour its goodness into every area of our life. I had created space to allow it to do that on its own and I didn't have to be in control. I didn't have to make it happen. I just said yes. Yes to God, day in and day out. And that's what, our, <clears throat> that's what the purpose and intention of our spiritual practices are or rituals that we do every day. So my invitation to you this week is to look at your life and what are your spirit, daily spiritual practices. And this isn't about perfectionism. It's not about I have to do them every day or I fail. It's having that basic set intention and structure and doing them as much every day as you can. But what are my spiritual practices? What are my rituals that remind me that the power and the presence and the love of God is greater than every other aspect of my life? That it is even greater than my own finite perceptions? I read this beautiful, um, I've been reading this beautiful book called Torah Journeys by Rabbi Shefa Gold. And I loved what I read this week. She was talking about in Exodus the, um, God's instruction to the Jews of creating a mishkan, I don't know if I'm saying that right, which is a movable temple, a movable sanctuary. And there was a lot of rules of how to create this movable sanctuary. And there's a lot of beauty involved, just like the Ark of the Covenant is a very beautiful uh, ark. 
And she was talking about the power of beauty and the, when we create something, but in the intention of it, the structure, the intention of the structure is to bring us within. That the mikshan also was, is, has an incredible spaciousness within it. The Ark of the Covenant, there's space within it. That the, the beauty is there to open our hearts. Spiritual, spirituality always opens our hearts and to dive deep inwardly into that spaciousness. It's, it's to invite us in, to make it well, to make our entry into the interior world welcome. She says it becomes a golden calf when we start worshiping the, the temple itself, the beauty itself. It becomes, a, the golden calf is solid. There's nothing interior to it. Now we're totally focused on the thing. And so that happens sometimes with our spiritual practices. We get so focused on, I got to do the right spiritual practices, and it's the spiritual practices that are doing, making my life better, or the rituals, or what, whatever that is that we're using to remind ourselves about that, the God. That's the beauty to draw us in, to welcome us and invite us into our interior spaciousness. But we're not here to idolize the practices. Just as on a Sunday morning, we're not here. People, I think in traditional religion, it was sort of, I have people say, well, I don't go to church on Sunday, and they're apologizing to me. And I'm like, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay if you don't go to church. Because you know, there, there's no right or wrong about church. The only purpose of a church, the only purpose of a talk, the only purpose of the music is to open our hearts and to invite us to dive deeper inwardly, to make us want to go deeper into our own interior I am that I am. That's why we're here. So we're doing that with our spiritual practices. We're allowing the beauty and the structure not to get attached to it, but to open us up to our interior world, to that wonderful spaciousness. And then, as we enter into that wonderful interior spaciousness, it's a spaciousness that has no borders. So we start welcoming other people into that state of surrender. When they're ready, they can enter into that temple, that interior temple that we're creating. And then we get to be a healing presence for other people. Last week I mentioned I worked at um, a psychiatric hospital many years ago. And there was an uh, evening where I was in the middle of the night, a woman was brought in, and she was suicidal. And they put her in the isolation room to keep her safe. She had already been in the hospital. She'd already had lots of therapy. She'd already been, um, had tried all sorts of medication. None of it was work, had worked, and she was done. She said, there's no point anymore. Nothing works. I'm done. So by the time I came in in the morning, they felt that she was at least safe enough to come out of the isolation room and be in her room. But she wouldn't get out of bed. The, she wouldn't get, take any medication. She wouldn't do anything therapy work. Her drapes were drawn. It was dark. So I went in there, and she was just, the covers, I couldn't even see her. The covers were up, and she was just done. You know, she was just going to lie there until she died. I don't have any magic formulas. I sat with her. I knew she'd had therapy. I knew she had had medications. What was I going to say? And there was nothing to say except to meet her where she was, which is total surrender. And I just said, I get it. I get when you've tried everything. I've been there. And I started sharing my own experience of just feeling like I'm powerless, and I had no power, and I couldn't, no matter how much knowledge I had, I couldn't change. And as I shared with her, the room just became pure energy, and light was swirling around, and there was nothing solid. Her bed, my chair, her, me, nothing was solid, and I was aware of words coming out of my mouth, but I don't know what those words were, because the energy was just so alive. And as you hear, as we all hear from the mystical traditions, that when we're in that place, it's not like, oh, it's the most normal thing in the world. That in fact, this density starts to feel abnormal the more we start moving into that light and that energy swirling around. And so as the conversation is, whatever I'm saying, I don't know what that is, and the energy, there was a part of me that just knew when it was complete. I got up, I walked out of the room, I went to the nursing station right across from a room, and I just started working. Again, because when you're in that space, it's normal. 15 minutes later, she opens the door, all the light from her room. She's opened the curtains. She's fully dressed. She has makeup on, her huge smile. And she's, hey, where's my therapy group? And off she went to her therapy group. Spirit can shift us in a moment when we surrender. There was no fix. There, but that infinite good is always waiting for us, always. 
That shift is available in the moment we just surrender and let go and say, Spirit, this heaven on earth consciousness, this infinite oceanic love, it's real. It's at the center of your being right now, and it's giving of itself now. The question is, are we surrendered enough, soft enough, willing enough to allow its goodness in every area of our life and to build those daily structures as individuals and as a community to create the spaciousness, the invitation to go interior to that inner world. Yes. <laughs> there's another aspect of surrender. I'm going to be really quick on this part. Then there, there, there's also that place of surrender when things, when we start to surrender, because this happens, and I think I need to mention it, where things don't immediately get better. <laughs> Glad I mentioned that. <laughs> Where in fact we are led in directions that we may not like. And then it gets really hard to surrender because then we're not so sure this infinite, this is when it's really important to remember this is infinitely good presence. It only wants my good. And we surrender anyways, even though what's showing up doesn't feel right, even though I think I'm way clearer that there's, I have better good in mind than what's showing up. I can just give a testimony to this, uh, that, that that's what was ministry for me, that I surrendered. It was easy when I got the call. I just surrendered and surrendered. As long as it was off in the distance, it was fine. So I went through the program, became a minister, and even knew when I was going to the church, what church I was going to. And again, how spirit first cause is greater than all physical form. Um, I knew that I was part of going to be the minister of the church. So even though they went through the candidating process, and did all the interviews and really felt like they were in control, I knew they had no control. <laughs> Not because I had control, but because I had seen it. Because there is this presence that really loves us and is always guiding us, when we, all of us, and, and moving us along. So I step into the church, and, I, and I'm now a minister, and I've said yes, and I love that I'm a surrendered being of light, and I realized I hated it. And I was so, it was so challenging. I was so angry with God. Here I trusted you and you gave me this career where I'm center of attention and people want to look at me and ask me what I think about things and all I wanted to do was hide. I'd been the youngest with three brothers. I was used to being invisible in a good, and I liked it. <laughs> so I wasn't looking to, for this. And so I was so shocked at the experience and I thought that God really didn't love, didn't really know me, didn't really know who I really was deep down to have guided me on this. And I'd like to say I was so evolved in my surrender that I got over this pretty quickly, but unfortunately it's just recently that I got over it. I, <laughs> I am a fighter when I believe I'm right. So that's what I, just, I get it. And I laugh when other people say when they're fighting, and I don't mean to be rude, but I just get it. That when, and, and, it wasn't, and I kept saying yes, so I was still doing my spiritual practices, I still was showing up and doing ministry, but there was always this fight the whole time. It was like, yes, no, yes, no, break and, and the accelerator on at the same time. So finally, I just let go of the whole thing. I just said, this past year, I just said, okay, I'm done, I'm done fighting with you, God, I'm right about this. <laughs> I have tried it for long enough, and I'm convinced myself that I'm right. And I just let it go. And in that moment, I was sitting in meditation, and it was, it was truly a joy that I suddenly realized it's not about a career, it's not about a job, that ministry is who I am, and that it is a, that it is a state of being that I had embodied. All those years I was fighting it, I actually had started embodying it without realizing it. And I looked at who I was in the 1990s, so afraid to even say a word in a class, to who I've become and I realized how much God loved me to keep pushing me on this path. And I was saying, no, yes, no, yes. And finally, and I, this good poured forth. And why I'm so grateful for that blessing is I can support other people now. When other people are feeling called to something, there's a voice calling them to something that makes them so uncomfortable. And they're saying, yeah, that can't be from God. Or I don't want to do that. And I, and I get that a lot. Do you, do you know when you say you surrender? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I can support, well, actually can laugh <laughs> out of joy that I'm not the only one, but also support and say, I really know this now. I really know, not just conceptually, not just by looking at the world and saying, oh, it's becoming a better place, so God must love me, but to really know that when we surrender, even whether when we surrender and things start to all heal or when things get a little more difficult, 
it's always, always, always going to be good. Always it is going to be for our individual highest good that we are going to become more than we could ever possibly imagine. We are going to express more light and more love than we can ever possibly imagine. So we hold that possibility as we are surrendering and giving ourselves to spiritual practices that what we are giving to ourselves is infinitely good to expect good, good, and more good, more love, more joy, more peace, more harmony, more beauty, more creative, more abundance than we could ever possibly imagine. As we continue to say, yes, this is the life of sweet surrender. <laughs>